1954, I, a uh, very young, ambitious man going into the military. I had been taken from my parents when I was four years old, and I was raised in a, a military boarding school, three of them. First one for six years, I went home for 30 days, came back, went to another military boarding school, and then went home after that, and went to another one. I kept running away from these uh, these schools because I couldn't I couldn't embrace couldn't embrace them. But eventually, I, my mind began to think like a military person. I will tell you a short story of why I chose to resign from the military and not seek that life anymore. I was in the military in Japan in 1956. I was stationed at a, a strategic air command base in Yokota, Yokota Air Base. During the 50s, the Yokota Air Base and Tachikawa Air Base were used to transport military equipment and personnel to, to the war that was going on in Korea. And after the Korean War, of course, the U.S. kept making huge bombers. And there was a B-52, a huge bomber with a huge payload. The mile-long runways that, were, that were, we were using in, in Yakota and Tachikawa were no, they couldn't support then a, a liftoff of a B-52. They could land there, but fully loaded, they couldn't, they couldn't rise. So they sought the half a mile of land, rich farmland, to extend the, the base at, uh, at Tachikawa. At the end of that base is a little community, farm, farming community called Sunagawa. People began to demonstrate, the students, the farmers, and members of the Nipponzan Myohoji. They began to chant every day and they began to build up. And then when summer was coming along and school was out, then huge demonstrations. They decided on one huge demonstration in front of both bases, the Yokota Air Base and, and Tachikawa. And early that morning before they arrived, they called all the military uh, personnel together and they said that there may be an attempt to, uh, for some of them to scale the, the fence and come over the fence. During that briefing, a young man next to me asked, what should we do if they come over that fence? And the answer was to shoot them. I had been raised in a military boarding school, even though I hated what, uh, what I had been going through as, as a rip from my mother and my parents and my grandparents. Still, I, I was hopefully going to be a military personnel, but I couldn't understand. There was no war going on, absolutely no war at all. And, and the rules of engagement in the military time, even now, is civilians are different not to be shot upon. That's the teachings, but that isn't the practice. I know that now, that it, it's a very ugly, war is, is, is ugly. As they came, we, we, we went out there and we were stationed 10 feet apart and with automatic rifles. And there was cyclone fence there and then beyond that there was the Japanese army and then Japanese police. And then we could hear, we could hear them coming from a great distance. We could hear the, the drums. The, there must have been 90,000 people, but many, many drums. And they were chanting a, some sort of chant that I never heard of in my life. And we were kind of getting scared of the, of the pursuit. Here they, here they were. And then all of a sudden, the, my fear became lost in the 
magnificence of what I was, what I was seeing. I was seeing for the first time uh, a great number of people who were, in, in my mind, flashed back immediately to what was happening to Indian land. And I could see that's what they were doing. They were saying to the U.S. military, and they were saying to the U.S. Go US government, no more land. You're not going to take one more acre from us, not for this military buildup that you're doing. But they started, they gathered in front there, and there, the, the monks and nuns were chanting very peacefully, singing. As I said, I never heard that before. And then I began to, there was some commotion, and then I seen the police rushing the, uh, the students and the monks and the farmers, and they were hitting them. And the monks were just chanting, kept chanting. And the police began to hit him and uh, hit him on the head. And it sounded like coconuts that they were cracking. It was that, that moment that I felt that uh, this is not something that, I, that, I, that I'd wished for. This is not, this is not the path that I, I, I wanted to be in. I had never heard of the concept nonviolence. And I kept thinking, why don't they get up and fight these people? Why don't they get up and start fighting it out? There's 90,000 people out there. And there's probably about 300 policemen. Greatly outnumbering these policemen, I felt, why don't they get up and fight them? They can beat them. I had never heard of, of the concept of nonviolence. I didn't know what it was. That's what I was looking at. And then Sergeant Johnson began to shoot in the air. And they halted. And he was yelling in Japanese to stop, stop it. Immediately, they, well, they did stop for that moment in a way. But the demonstration kept going on. And all day long, there was, there was ambulances coming. And every now and then, they'd break out again. And they'd be shoving and pushing and clubbing and hitting. And the ambulances kept coming all day long. That moment in my history, I, I began to realize that this is not something I wanted, and I, I wanted to get out of it. I could not support the order. We voiced it. We voiced it. The sergeant voiced it, and I voiced it. And a number of other people saying, no, we can't do this. That day ended, and I went home. Some months later, I, I left uh, the left. I left the military, and I often wondered about these people. And then, 20 years, 21 years went by. We were planning this this walk, the longest walk in 1977, and uh, the walk was. Uh, to take place from Alcatraz all the way across the United States to Washington, D.C. We were, call, we were going to walk across this country to show America, to tell America that, that we were also were sick and tired of, of the abuse, the noncompliance of, of, of them enforcing the many treaties that have been made in this country. And so, that's why we walk, that's why we were going to walk. A young man came there. He was dressed like, and he had a white, and yellow, and he had the same drum, and he was chanting a song. He, he was walking up to the university where I was. A, I was the chancellor of this university, Indian University in in, in Davis, California, and. Uh, all of a sudden, my mind is just, wow, what, what, like flashing back. And I, I, I'm, uh, that tune, and, and I still didn't know what the words were. And uh, his name was Shigeki Minimatsu. And he came there and he started, uh, he stayed with me for about three, four weeks. And he would chant every morning, chant every night. But he would help us. We were fixing up the, 
some of the dorms and he kept volunteering, stayed there with us. And then I, he said, what is this walk you're doing? And I told him, he said, well, you know, our people walk also. The, and he told me about Nipponzan Miyohoji. And I said, do you think they would walk with us? He said, I, I, I'll, I think they would. He says, uh, but write them. And so I wrote to uh, Guruji, uh, the Honorable Nichidatsu Guruji Fuji, and asked them if they would help us walk across America. And they accepted the invitation. And then halfway through the walk, uh, the walk was already in progress. And, and then here comes a large delegation from Japan, maybe 10, 15 monks and nuns. And as they were walking up from the university to where the sweat lodge grounds were at and the Sundance grounds, they were all chanting. And I was watching them as they were coming up and my mind flashed back to 1956. I thought, holy crap. And I, I didn't I didn't feel scared, but I thought, wow, this is this is really this is something that I I must remember. And they were they were singing, chanting this Nam Myoho Ring and Kyo. I still didn't know what it meant. And then I was introduced to Guruji. And I, immediately I felt I was in the presence of a man who was of great importance, a man of strong spiritual strength. He was about five foot eight or nine. He was in a wheelchair. And he came into the sweat lodge ceremony with me and we talked about about Nam Yohori and Kyo. And joined the walk with all of the monks and nuns and eventually uh, perhaps maybe 50, 60 people and walked with our walk into Washington, D.C. and gave magnificent speeches about nonviolence and, and what Native people were going through. This was 1978, and um, he invited me to go to Japan. And I went there, went back. As he was showing me some of the pictures, I still had not made the connection of him being at Tsunagawa and until he was showing me these pictures. And he, it was a big military base. I said, where is this base at? And he said, that's Atachikawa, and that was at Sunagawa. And I told him I was there. And at that moment when I told him that, we both looked at each other, and he said, Nam, you already you kill. And I knew, I knew that this was something that destiny had brought us together, a very strange, wonderful force. I had been involved in, in, prior to our meeting, I had been involved to, at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, 1973, and where the government surrounded us, and there was 300 FBI agents, 90 U.S. Marshals, and a great number of other rednecks who grabbed guns and uh, they were shooting at us for 71 days. But our warriors, were, we, we fought back, we shot back. We answered them. And uh, took me to trial on that. And I was standing there before the judge and they were reading off all these charges. 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, each indictment. Facing a total of 250 years in prison, plus a life sentence. It was very, it was, it was absurd. The best that I could do was just laugh at, at, at all these charges that they were 
conjuring up. And I said, there's, I kept, there's no way I can do it 250 years oh, and a life sentence. We talked into the night at Atami. And then I traveled with him to India and to Sri Lanka. And during the course of my travel with him, I became then introduced to what nonviolence was. And also the power of prayer, the power of spirituality, the, the strength of it. I learned all of that from Guruji. He became my teacher, he became my friend, and a very close relative. I still look up to him. I said, well, how do we use nam myoho He said, one day you will find that out. He tried to explain to me that there's no literal translation of nam myoho I have many children, but I've only seen one of them being born. And when I saw her coming into this life, I said, Wow. Now I know what it means. It just it's it's a it's a it's an expression of greatness, it could be expression of sorrow, but fulfillment and a great teacher, a great teaching. I know what Namyaho means. And after my many trials with this government, I still am very, I still, uh, even though Guruji said, don't be so angry, don't be so hateful in your life, I, he said, channel that, channel that hatefulness into goodness, into good power. So I began to think about the Creator, and I, I called upon the Creator one day, and I said, I'm very grateful for this life, but I still have this anger in me about what, what, what happened with, when I was taken from my parents. I still have that. And he said, well, just confront the government every day. Confront them with prayers. Confront them. Bring it up. Tell them. And then I thought, can you give me Creator, can you give me 250 years to do this? <laughs> and the Creator looked at me, he said, you know, I could do that. I could do that. And I uh, said, before I go, he says, is there, is there anything else? I said, yes, a life sentence. And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing 250 years plus a life sentence. Thank you. around us has, has that spirit, but the tree and to us the maple Waktatsuha is the leader of all the trees. But back a long time ago when we buried our weapons of war, we uprooted this tree and we threw everything in there and let those underground waters take where those roots were, take those weapons away so we would never know war again. Yeah.